This morning, I'd like to ask you to turn your Bibles to the book of First. A message that is rather lengthy. Prophet of the Old Testament. An amazing prophet of God. So much written about him that is so tremendous, so wonderful, so overwhelming. We learn so much from Elijah. Well, we're going to learn from Elijah this morning in a very, very different circumstance. Not in his position of victory. Not in his position of miraculous works. Not while he is sharing God through his life, through his prophecies. But through a most difficult time of his life. Through a time of his life that I think all of us share. I had written down four things that were taking place in his life at the time that I will be teaching from. He'll be in a cave. He'll be all alone. He's on the run. I think in so many ways he's trying to hide. At some point in time, he doesn't feel there's any way out. There's no way out at all. Now, I don't know if any of you have ever felt this way, but I have. He was feeling discouraged, disillusioned, alone, and defeated. He was hurting. He was in great pain inside. It's so much easier to deal with the pain that's on the outside. But when the pain is on the inside, sometimes it is so hard. And it's such a feeling that can overwhelm you. What do I do? The message of the, the, the lesson this morning is God speaking to Elijah and asking a question. In that cave, what are you doing here? What are you doing here? I'm going to ask you this morning. Let's start that way. What are you doing here? Why did you come? Does it mean anything to you? You start doing things repetitiously without any thought, without any feeling, without any thinking. You can. Some marriages are like that. You get up in the morning, you go to work, you come home, you watch TV, you go to bed, and you do it day in and day out, and it becomes meaningless. How important it is for us to know where we are, what we're doing, and why we're doing it all the time. Listen, life is short. I like what my what Pastor Chuck said. You see, Pastor Rawl, who is my pastor, introduced me to Pastor Chuck. And Pastor Chuck would always say this. You only have one life to live. And it will soon pass. And the only thing that will last is what you've done for Christ. So how in my life, long experiences, whether it's my marriage or my being a parent or my being a grandparent, or I, I got to put this one in there. I'll soon be a great grandparent. My, uh, Elijah, I think, makes a huge mistake. You mean this great prophet? The greatest prophet? Yeah. He made a huge mistake. God asked him a question. What are you doing here? And he doesn't really answer God. He does something else. Listen up. He does something else. How many times when we know what God wants us to do, then we do something else. 
Does God need to ask you the question? Because the Bible says here that God's word asked them the question. You read your Bible, you come to church, you enter into this building Sunday morning, and many of you I know, you've come many, many years, and th there is a danger, a great sin in the sin of pretense. The sin of pretense is doing something for a different reason than most people think you do it. You come to satisfy your your obligation, you come to satisfy your wife so she doesn't get mad at you, or maybe your husband so he doesn't get mad at you. You come because you think you're supposed to, but are you coming with open ears? A ready heart? So that what takes place here today can have meaning? Are you waiting for me to scream? The, the earth to shake? I don't want to hear unless it's tremendous. Listen, I don't know how the message will come over to you this, this morning. It may be a profound message that God speaks to your heart. I think everybody receives something a little bit different. But listen carefully. The title of the message is A Still Small Voice. A Still Small Voice. Still small... In, in the Hebrew, a whispering sound. Are you listening? Some, sometimes it's more clear when it's a still, small voice. That's the way God chooses to speak to Elijah. And the only place in the Bible you will see this verse take place is right here. In 1 Kings chapter 19. I better get to it because I'm going to run out of time real quick. I can tell. Turn to verse 9. Chapter 19, 1 Kings, verse 9. And there he went into a cave and spent the night in that place. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him. And he said to him, What are you doing here, Elijah? Elijah. And so he said, I have been very zealous for the Lord God of hosts, for the children of Israel have forsaken your covenant, torn down your altars, and killed your prophets with the sword. I alone am left, and they seek to take my life. Then the Lord said, Go out and stand on the mountain before the Lord, and behold, the Lord passed by. And a great and strong wind tore into the mountains and broke the rocks in pieces before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind, an earthquake. But the Lord was not in an earthquake. And after the earthquake, a fire. But the Lord was not in the fire. Oh, how much more dramatic it would be. The earth shakes. The winds blow the rocks off the mountain. The fire comes. How awesome. That's not the way the Lord wanted to speak to Elijah that day. Could the Lord speak that way? Absolutely. And in the Bible, many times the Lord has spoken in those ways, but not this time. Not this time. You see, Elijah had already been hit. He was already hurt. He had reason to feel discouraged, to feel disillusioned, to feel alone, and to feel defeated. I have to go to the first verse of the 19th chapter. Why did he feel the way he did? Why was he hiding in that cave that day? It was because Ahab, here it is, verse 19, or, or verse, uh, chapter 19, verse 1, Ahab told Jezebel all that Elijah had done, also how he had executed all the prophets with the sword. Then Jezebel sent a message to Elijah saying, So let the gods do to me, and more also, if I do not make your life as the life of one of them by tomorrow. 
about this time. So within 24 hours, the wife of Ahab, who was Ahab? Ahab was the worst king that ever lived. This was a time where the kingdom of Israel was divided into the north and the south. And in the north, which was called Israel, the sixth king that took the throne was Ahab, the worst of the worst. You know what made him the worst? You know what made him the worst? He was wishy-washy. He was spineless. He was gutless. He would not stand up for truth. He was afraid. He was a coward. He let his wife do the talking for him. You know who his wife was? Queen. Now, you've all heard this name, Jezebel. Anybody named their daughters Jezebel lately? <laughs> Just like you don't name your child Judas. Jezebel had a horrible, horrible life. She was a Phoenician. She followed the god Baal. And Baal was... A, her life, not just her God. He was her life. She believed in him. She trusted him. he was the God of plenty. Uh, greed was birthed through Baal. Now understand, she hated the God of Elijah. Your God and my God, she hated him. Yahweh God, she hated him. And she did everything she could to have all who followed after that God, our God, the prophets of God killed. She'd find them, she'd kill them. Elijah had to do something. So he knows who is the true living God, and he creates an opportunity for the prophets of Baal to prove their God is a real God. And so they go to where? Mount Carmel. And at Mount Carmel, this contest takes place. Elijah says, Go build your altar at the top of Mount Carmel. Build your altar there, and we'll see whose God is real. Build the altar and put the, the bull upon the altar. Chop it up. Put it on the altar as an offering to your God, but don't light the fire. Call, and, call to your God and let your God light the fire. And they called, and they called, and they heard, heard, nothing happened. Nothing took place. They, they cut themselves. They did everything they could to get the attention of their God. But because there was no God, as is the case with all false gods, nothing took place. Uh, and then Elijah. Elijah against 450 prophets of Baal. 400 prophets of Asherah against Elijah. Elijah has the altar built, and he calls upon the name of the Lord, and fire comes down from heaven. The, everybody watching, the Lord, he is God. He is God. Yahweh is God. Victory, right? What was Elijah thinking? Finally, finally, I have living proof here. God did such a miracle. The world will know. Everybody at, the, at Mount uh, Carmel knew. Wait till Jezebel knows. She'll convert to the real living God. But she doesn't. Here it is in chapter 19. When she hears what took place, she, she makes a promise to kill that day Elijah. Verse 4, chapter 19. He, verse 3 says, And when he saw that, comma, what, what did he see? He really didn't see anything. He heard that she was going to kill him. But what, now, if you could just circle that word, saw. He saw. This is a dangerous thing, people. When you take your eyes off of God and you put them on the thing that draws you to fear that births fear in you rather than keeping your eyes on God like Simon Peter who was on the sea took his eyes off of God and put him on the sea began to sink what did Elijah do he took his eyes off of God and he put him on a woman listen he would stand up against 850 prophets of false idols Bravely, but when a woman, a man, she must have been some kind of, of evil woman, 
He's terrified of her, and he begins to run. When he saw, verse 3, he rose and ran for his life and went to Beersheba, way south. Now he's in the southern portion of the divided kingdom, which is Judah, and left his servant there. Verse 4, but he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness and came and sat under a broom tree, and he prayed that he might die. What? And said, it is enough. Now, Lord, take my life, for I am no better than my father or no better than my ancestors. Things that draw my attention. He prays that he might die. Now, I know the story of Elijah. Just to put you a little bit ahead, Elijah never dies. He's one of those in the Bible who never dies. He's taken up in a whirlwind while in a chariot of fire, a miraculous and wonderful and very, very tremendous departure from this earth. But he didn't die. I'm so glad God doesn't give us what we ask for sometimes. How many times have you, maybe, maybe some of you, and I, I've never felt this way, but I know people that have, and it's a horrible, horrible, horrible feeling that you have nothing to live for, and now you want to die. I've had friends in ministry that have committed suicide. I, and I don't pre- pretend to know all the answers. Do they all go to heaven or do they all go to hell if they were godly? I don't know. But do godly people feel this way? Here's living proof that they do. And you better stop judging if you're judging people that take their lives. Or you'd be judging Elijah right now. And he was one of the greatest prophets that ever lived. Sometimes it's better to say nothing than to say something and be wrong. And why is he wanting to die? It is enough. It is enough. All these things have happened to me. I'm going to go through four things. He was discouraged. He was so discouraged, so discouraged that he wanted to die. But I want to share with you this morning. Why did he want to die? J. Vernon McGee said he was overworked, overwrought, and overworried. He had done all that he possibly could do. But for the sake of his beloved Israel. He had worked and worked and worked. And now he is worrying himself to death. What was he trying to do? Get people to know that Jehovah God is God. Our God. The only God. And everyone uh, worshiping false gods. We're going to die. And we go to hell. On Mount Carmel, they all realized that God was who he said he was. And he thought revival was coming, but it didn't. Psalms 43, 5 says, why am I discouraged? Why is my heart so sad? I'll tell you why it is. Because you've gotten your eyes off of the answer in Psalm 43 5 it says my hope is in God my hope is in God my hope isn't in my paycheck my hope isn't in you my hope isn't in my wife my hope isn't in my children even my beloved great grandchild that's not my hope my hope is in one one God one Lord one Savior his name is Jesus Christ Above all, beyond all, there's nothing that takes his place. Not money, not women, not men, not anything. He is my God, and I worship him. And I worship him in spirit, and I worship him in truth. And I don't make a game about it. I don't come to church for no reason. I come to church to learn more of him. To embrace him, to lean on him, because I need him. And one day I'm going to need him more than I need him today. And I want to be ready. He is disillusioned. Elijah did not get what he wanted. He thought what would happen is that everybody would turn to God. 
But they didn't turn to God. They turned back to their own ways. Have you ever been in a position where you wanted something to happen so badly? Oh, if I could just get to this person, I could just get to that person. And you thought you got to them with the gospel of Jesus Christ. You thought that you shared with them to the point where they will turn to God, undeniably turn to God. You've worked on them for so long. You've sacrificed for so much. And then it didn't happen. And what do you do? You look at yourself. You blame yourself. I'm disillusioned. Will it ever happen? I think of Pastor Rawl and myself. Do you know how long he prayed for me? Do you know how long my mother prayed for me? My father prayed for me? Listen, everybody here, I don't care how many people in this room, you are a product of someone's prayer. Don't stop praying. Disillusionment can kill you. Romans 9.33 says, Behold, I lay in Zion a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. Speaking of Jesus Christ. But he who believes in him will not be disappointed. Whatever it is that has disillusioned you, believe confidently that God has not squandered his plan for you. He will redeem you. And not only will he redeem you as Pastor Larry spoke this first service, but he will heal you. It's not going to be the way that you feel that it is all the time. You ever notice how things seem so much worse at night when you've laid your head on the pillow? And you know, you just know in the back of your mind, when I finally fall asleep, I'm going to wake up in just two hours. And about three o'clock in the morning, you can't get back to sleep because you're disillusioned. There's no answers. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. Acknowledge him in all your ways and he will guide your paths. Listen, he was feeling alone. Number three, he was feeling all alone. Now, Elijah is living according to his feelings. Let me read once again his response to the Lord. Verse 14, because he asked the question twice, what are you doing here, Elijah? And he said, I have been very zealous for the Lord God of hosts because the children of Israel have forsaken your covenant, torn down your altars, and killed your prophets. I alone am left. And now they seek my life. He feels alone. I tell you, we're in a room right now with over a thousand people. Just look around. But there's somebody in this congregation this morning that feels all alone. There's some women sitting next to their husbands who live in a house where they both have lived for many, many years. But they feel all alone. If you're one of them, maybe you're single and we're filled with a a, 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 a thousand people who want to be your friend, but they don't want to be your husband. They don't want to be your wife. And so you feel alone. And so it's not about people being around me. It's about a feeling that I have attached my heart to. Why do I feel alone? It's because you're being he held captive you're being held captive by your feelings. You see, I, I, I think Elijah began to believe what the enemy was saying to him. I don't think he really knew he was alone. You know why? Because the Bible had told me previously in the 16th chapter that Obadiah, or, yeah, Obadiah had hid another hundred prophets, 50 in each location, to preserve the prophets of God. So I think Elijah knew he wasn't alone. But he felt alone. What do I do when I feel alone? 
You might want to write this one down. Psalm 73, verse 23 through 26. You see, Elijah begins to believe what his circumstances are saying to him. And he feels alone. David writes, Nevertheless, I am continually with you, the Lord speaks. You hold my right hand, you guide me with your counsel, and afterward you will receive me to glory. Whom have I in heaven but you? And there is nothing on earth that I desire besides you. Maybe that's the answer. Okay, can we just get spiritual for a moment? And stop playing religion? And start believing that God is with me and in me and works through me? Is around me? Is upon me? With me? I can prove that he is because you see God speaks in that still small voice in many ways. Through his word, through others, through circumstances. And some of you right now are hearing a still small voice saying, that's me. That's me. But I feel all alone. You're not alone. But maybe your desire for God has dwindled. Remember when you were on fire to read, to pray, to come to church? You wanted to be in the company of fellow believers because it helped so much? Listen, I'm one who has, I, I, in my life, I have backslidden. I know what it feels like to have been on fire for the Lord. And then the flame goes out. And my desire leaves me. I came back because of that. I didn't want to be alone anymore. With God in my life, I am never alone. But my desire must be for him and not for another person. For if he is hidden with me in Christ, then how can I ever be alone? Lastly, he is feeling defeated he is feeling defeated from the greatest victory on mount carmel to where he is now you know where he is now he's on mount horeb mount horeb down south it's also called mount sinai the mountain of god where moses received the law the covenant with his people given on Mount Sinai. Great works take place on Mount Sinai. And God speaks. Elijah feeling a tremendous victory just a few days before. A victory over 850 prophets of false gods. 450 were slain of the prophets of Baal that day. That's what made Jezebel so angry. Elijah praying to God for fire to come down and light that sacrifice, creating such a tremendous movement among the people. They be all, all began, began to call out that God is the true God. Yahweh is God. But now, from his greatest victory on Mount Carmel to the mountain of God, he is experiencing his greatest defeat. How ironic. How ironic. Maybe he forgot what victory really was. Victory in my heart. Victory over sin. Victory over myself. 
2 Corinthians 4, verses 8 through 10. We are troubled on every side, yet not distressed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Cast down, but not destroyed. People, you're indestructible. You're indestructible. You can walk out of this building one way or the other. It's up to you this evening, this morning. You can believe in the word of God and trust in that still small voice that's speaking to you right now and hang on to it because the world is against you and the world is going to attack you and try and convince you otherwise the moment you leave this building. And if you cannot, listen, this morning, hold on now to the word of God while surrounded by fellow Christians. How are you going to do it when you're at work tomorrow morning and everybody there just about doesn't believe in God? We better up it up one. We better learn how to trust in that still small voice that's going to leave here with you. That still small voice that means so much in the midst of the turmoil in your life, the midst of the turmoil in your marriage, the midst of the turmoil between you and your children, at home, at work, or wherever you are. How will I deal with it? Because you see, here's the problem. Jesus asked Elijah, what are you doing here? And Elijah does not give him an answer. He gives him an excuse. That's what he does. He gives God an excuse. Now, God already knows why he's there. He's there because he's discouraged. He's disillusioned. He's fearful. He's defeated. But he doesn't want to admit it, I guess. Because he says, Lord, I was the one. That's not the answer. That's not why you're there. Listen to why. Listen to the answer that you will respond to God with. Why are you or what are you doing there? What are you doing today? Actually, Elijah wasn't doing anything. He was there just feeling sorry for himself. He was there hurting in pain, suffering, but he wasn't doing anything. This is the message this, this morning. He wasn't doing anything. Elijah responded with the reason he was there, or we could call it the excuse for being there, but he did not answer the question. The question demands an answer. And if we are going to be overcomers, then we need to know what we should be doing. And I'm going to end with this. Verse 15, chapter 19. Partial, I'm going to give you a part of the sentence, and I'm going to leave you with this. Then the Lord said to Elijah, after hearing his excuse for the second time, that he was the only one, he is the only one left, and they're coming to take my life. And the Lord said to him, one word, two letters, go. Go. Listen, people, if you're discouraged this morning, get up and go. Not from this building right now, by the way. <laughs> but when you get home, stop, stop the whining. You can't stop the pain and the hurt. But you can direct, you can redirect yourself. You can pick up the word of God. You can get on your knees, you can pray, you can begin to serve. I'll tell you what, serving God is the remedy to most of your sorrows. Getting busy doing something else. You see, that's what God told Elijah to do. He says, get up and go and get back to doing what I told you to do. And the rest of the chapter is all about that. Go, I have work for you to do, and God has work for you to do in your home, in your personal life, in, in your workplace, wherever you are. Lord, open the doors for me to use these hands, to use these feet, to use these eyes, this mouth, to serve you, Lord. Make no room in your life for discouragement, disillusionment. for defeat it doesn't change a thing 
I'll leave you with this. Psalm 31. You could read the whole chapter, Psalm 31, but I'm only going to give you a couple of verses. Psalm 31, verses 1 and 2. In you, O Lord, I put my trust. Let me never be ashamed. Deliver me in your righteousness. Bow down your ear to me. Deliver me speedily. Be my rock of refuge, a fortress of defense for what reason? Lord, you and you alone can save me. And then I go down to verses 14 and 15 of Psalm 31. But as for me, I trust in you, O Lord. I say you are my God. And I'm going to paraphrase this, but it's in many versions. Verse 15, Psalm 31. My future is is in your hand. Deliver me from the hand of my enemies and from those who persecute me. So much there. Not me, Lord, you. I'm in your hands, Lord. I haven't done a very good job with it. My trust, my faith, my hope in you, Lord, not in things and certainly not in people. I hope I leave you with a word that will be a still, small voice to you today. Can we pray? Why don't we stand? You're going to sing one song anyway, standing. The guy coming out here is going to make you stand. You got a full day ahead of you. You got a lot of living to do. This message was for somebody in this room I know. And if discouragement and disillusionment and the struggles of this this life haven't burdened you down, made you feel like you're in a cave all alone, one day it will. This world is not heaven. There's no such thing except in the very, very end as heaven on earth. You can seek all you want. You won't find it in people or things. God is the answer. Has always been the answer. And always will be that still, small voice. Father, bless us, guide us, protect us this day. Watch over us. and Lord God, give us, Father, direction and guidance for our life. There be any in this room that are struggling, Lord, beyond anything they think they can handle. May they know you are near to them, Father. That you hold the future in your hand. And that you can do all things above all others. May we never be defeated, Lord. Not in Christ. And I thank you. And I praise you. For these things in Jesus most holy name and together we said amen. God bless you.